Welcome everybody to this very first episode of this webcast series, My Data Guest. In each episode, I will interview a data expert, and the goal is to learn more about the secrets and the best practices that led to their successful data science applications. Today, uh, I'm hosting Dennis Ganzaroli, who has been working with data for easily 15 years, sometimes as a data engineer, sometimes as a data scientist, and sometimes as a data analyst. Um, he has covered the full spectrum of the data professions. Often, when you talk to data professionals, you have this feeling that the job defines their expertise. They know what they know because they've been working on that during their career. Now, when you talk to Dennis, you actually realize that his knowledge is much larger than his purely professional environment. His passion for data allows him to expand from the daily routine and apply classic and modern data science algorithms to predict COVID spread, for example, or to predict the UEFA Euro 2020 soccer tournament. The beauty of talking to Dennis is indeed this versatility, this capability of applying the data expertise to every aspect of, the, of life. After all, everything can be converted to numbers and then everything can be inspected and predicted. So enough talking, let's start this interview. Hi, Dennis. Hi, Rosario. Tell us more about your professional self and what you do in your job. Yes, um, I'm working for a big telco actually for the biggest telco in Switzerland as head of reporting and data management. We measure the performance of the sales channels and do everything from data integration, data blending, up to creating dashboards, reports, and so on. Nice. And do you use NIME in your work? And if yes, what do you do with it? Yes, of course, we use NIME mainly as an ETL tool together with the NIME server to automate our workflows. We have quite a lot of daily reports that have to be ready uh, in the morning. So we are quite happy to have such a fantastic solution with NIME and the NIME server. Nice, thank you. <laughs> do, do you use it alone or uh, in combination with other tools? Yeah, we, we use it mainly together with Tableau, Tableau server. But, uh, you know, I, I always say to the stakeholders, Tableau is just a car body, but Nine is the real engine, is the real heart of these dashboards. I see, I see. Okay, so let's uh, talk a bit about um, the work that you have been doing in the past six months. I've been following your work uh, starting January this year, a bit before January this year, and I've seen a lot of interesting things. So um, the, the first, uh, let's let's start with the funny uh, part. So on June 20, on June, sorry, on June, June 10th, yeah. one day exactly before the start of the European Soccer Tournament, um, you managed to run a model and to predict correctly what the final game would have been. And you said it would be England versus Italy. How did you do that? <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe I asked uh, Maradona. No, uh, I used quite a well-known approach in the sports betting industry by using uh, linear regression to calculate the rating ratings of the teams. You know. It, so, what were the input variables? Yeah, the input variables. Uh, but you know, I didn't I didn't predict. The, the, the final game. I just uh, calculated the power ratings uh, before of the teams before of the tournament. So, you know, England, Italy, and Spain were on the top three of these rankings. By the way, all three teams made it to the semifinals. But, you know, Denmark was a surprise. Nobody saw they come. At the end, uh, Italy won. So, but it was okay, you know, because since I'm Italian too, uh, it was okay at the end, but you know, soccer soccer is a game with a lot of randomness. So Scores basically, are... what, what you are saying is that you were able to quantify yeah. the quality of the teams besides for Denmark, which nobody could quantify anyway. Yes, because you know, as I said, uh, soccer is a, is a is a game with a lot of randomness, and uh, how you have seen the final game was decided by a penalty shot out. 
And I don't think that it's every time possible to make a good forecast with, with such a lot of randomness. Uh, my power ratings were quite good enough because I've used the past games uh, to train the model. Uh, and these past games reflected quite good the strengths of the teams. I see. So actually, I admire this uh, uh, outcome because I did try. In the, I'm not an expert of soccer, so maybe my domain knowledge was lacking. But uh, I did try in the past to make some predictions, for example, about the World Cup. And I find it very, very hard because, uh, yeah, the data is not that much. And uh, you, you need also to uh, somehow encode the results of the is a previous game of the game in the of the games in the history so it's it's not um... yes you know uh, the the domain no, domain knowledge is very important also for soccer uh, for for example um the home field advantage is is a very important factor in soccer even without spectators it's still there you know another point is um, that you have to take just a portion of data uh, to train the model that um, that quantifies the history of the teams. So, for example, after a big tournament, everything changed, the teams changed, the coaches, the players, and you have to filter out these games. Uh, otherwise, you don't get a, a good model at the end. Right, right. So, but then you you said you used a linear regression, right? Yeah. Uh, so you use the coefficients of the linear regression. So you yeah. didn't use any sophisticated time series analysis, deep learning based um, model. No. no, no deep learning, no strong GPUs, just a simple linear regression model. So how long did it take to make this prediction? Because I remember that the tenth of June. I mean, it's one day. So how long uh -huh. did it take? a few seconds and to and to, to prepare the data not to prepare the data the whole, yes. to build the whole it, application. It, it was always a little bit a, a, a hobby to to make predictions for for big uh, soccer tournaments also once also for for the nfl and for the nhl it was a little bit a hobby um that i had but it's about in one day you got such a such a prediction. You just have to know where to collect the data. Uh, actually, these are just the, the past games of the teams, and then to code it that it makes sense, and you have uh, and you have your ratings. I see. I see. Okay. Um, so this uh, we can find. The, did you did you write some something about that where people can find the details? Um, Yes, I've write um, an article about it, but the article was about something else. It was more uh, about the questions that you, if you want to uh, to be a data scientist, you have to change hobbies, and and then and, you have to change soccer. No, <laughs> no, but if you uh, you can use uh, you can use examples of real life that you like and then implement it in your data science analysis. So you can start to learn with a, a real case model, real case example, and that is very important to, to get, get the passion on it. Okay, yeah, exactly. That's what I was saying at the beginning, that uh, you are able to investigate all aspects of life, um, you know, whatever it is, not necessarily only job related. Okay, so let's move to another project that was a bit more uh, serious, less uh, hobby-like. Yeah. Um, so in this project, this was, uh, I think it was in 2020, uh, you predicted the spread of COVID-19 worldwide. And then you also predicted the spread of COVID-19 country by country. Um, so do you want to tell us more about, uh, about this other project? Yes, my motivation behind this project was to forecast the evolution of the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, in the beginning, just for China, and then uh, because, because it started there, and then for every country in the world. I just wanted to answer the question, when will be this pandemic over? And it's still an open question until today. Right, and I remember, right, I remember that uh, you had a model for 
uh, to predict the spread of the pandemic in China and then worldwide. And then I yeah. remember that you started uh, going country by country and see how yeah. that uh, would affect the different countries. Yeah. Um, so did, did you use here a linear regression too? Which model did you use here? No, not uh, not. Uh, this was more complicated than uh, for uh, for the soccer tournament. You know, uh, the the evolution of a pandemic is a, is like a growth process. So the beginning is uh, is like an exponential function. You know, it goes up, then it changes to a sigmoidal curve, this S, no? which is best described by a logistic function. But this is quite good enough for one wave. But then when several waves followed, like in the COVID pandemic, I need another approach. And I found out that the Rockefeller University had already used in the late 90s uh, a method called loglet analysis. I don't think that uh, anybody knows this loglet analysis, but this loglet analysis was good to forecast the evolution of of uh, multiple overlapping logistic functions, was something like this, multiple S, and also called wave wavelets. And, and I must say that this approach was, was quite good. Yeah, you were quite precise in uh, uh, forecasting the spread of the pandemic. Worldwide, okay, that would have been maybe a bit easy, easier because it's, uh, it's a bigger uh, more coarse prediction, but even country by country, I remember that your yes, predictions. Yes. I, it's um, still, it's still, I'm still updating it uh, every every morning. This dashboard, ah. it's a, it's a dashboard on, on on Tableau Public. I use Tableau Public to 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 publish this dashboard, but uh, to to update the data, I use Nine. Exactly. So tell me exactly what, what did you use for that? Was was the uh, ETL and the whole transformation run with NIME and then just the visualization with Tableau? What what how, what was your approach tool wise? Yes, it's I used NIME together with Jupyter because you can call Python or Jupyter from NIME. So the data was prepared in NIME, but the model was actually on, and is actually calculated in Jupyter. With the SciPy package, uh, I tried to do everything in Nine, but at the end, uh, I had to say that this combination Nine Jupiter was the most effective to calculate for every country of the world every day uh, this forecast for the next thirty days. I see. So you you basically used a combination of different yes. um, but, tools. Uh, and uh, so, but but then you use Nime as the the tool that was calling all the other tools. Yes, I see, I see. So like the bus. Yes. Okay. Um, do you want to tell us? So I know about these two projects because mm -hmm. I was following what you were doing in the past a year and a half. Um, so if, if, do, do you have some other projects that you would like to? talk about about now or for example do you want to tell us about the biggest challenge you had to solve in your professional life the I biggest, mean, uh, the biggest challenge uh, wake up in the morning no uh, <laughs> the biggest challenge i think it's it's and it will always be to to explain like this morning to the clients or to the stakeholders uh, the story behind the data uh, data science is all about storytelling and you need strong communication skills and and always also a good visualization of the data it's very useful uh, as they say a picture is worth a thousand words it's it's still true you know especially true for data science I see. I see. So you say that uh, the biggest challenge was actually in communication. I have to say I've experienced the same problem. I it's easy, uh, for example, to find data scientists that they can uh, put together a model and um, put together some calculations, some data transformations, the whole thing. But then when it, it comes about understanding what the requirements of the job is or, or the project is and, uh, under and explaining what the results are, it's a, it's a bit more complicated than that, and not everybody um, can do that. Okay, so let's go back in time then. Uh, how long have you been using NIME? Uh, 
this was in the beginning of 2000, I think 2001, 2002. At that time, I was working for SPSS and I was selling Clementine. Clementine is a tool similar to Nine. Just the prices were not the same. Uh, can you imagine to pay uh, 65,000 Swiss francs huh, for a license for Nine? Not for the Nine server, for, for the desktop uh, license. But this was the price for Clementine, not for, for the server, for the desktop version. It's so time to change. But that, that's like 20 years ago. Yes. Has Nine years. improved in these 20 years now that you have seen Nine almost from the beginning? Yes, because I was looking for, for, a, for a tool like this. Because, you know, if you work at SPSS, at that time I was working for SPSS, and, the, uh, and I was very interested in, in this data science topic already then. And to get a good tool, uh, the only way was to work for this company. So I, I was know, yeah. always looking for, uh, watching for, for a tool that could do the same and to, uh, who was open source or something like this. Yeah. Uh, and, I see, I see. So um, let, me, let me ask another question here. Um, since you have all this experience, I mean, you, uh, you said 15 years, but you have been around the, the, the data uh, science world much longer, in my opinion. Um, so do you have any advice for all uh, the young, aspiring data scientists who are probably listening to us in, at, at the moment? Yes. You know, every time when somebody asks me this question, you know, in, on the social medias, I ask always back, what are your hobbies? Like I said before, no? And if data science is not your hobby, then, then you have to change hobbies because it, it needs the passion to succeed it. Uh, otherwise, uh, it will not work. Uh, learning is not enough. You, know? you must feel it. Yeah? So it's not a job. It's not just a job. No, it's not just a job. It's, it's more because it has such a lot of topics and uh, it needs really a big uh, involvement to, to, to get far. Yeah. I see, I see. Um, but then, what? So, uh, when when you get questions uh, from the young aspiring data scientists, then they tell you, um, you know, what they are supposed to do. Are there any skills that you would recommend them to yeah. care more, um, you yeah. know, than just uh, the 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 university curriculum? Yes, yes. Something um, to cultivate to have an edge with respect to other candidates. Yeah. I think one of the most uh, important skills, but not only in data science, I think in, in, in quite a lot of jobs, is to keep cool, to keep cool in stress situations. But, and never forget one thing, that it's a job, you know, it's not a game. Because the most time you will do things that you don't really like, but that are still very important for the business, for the stakeholders, for the company, I don't know. So yes, data science must become your hobby, but the job is not a hobby and it will never be a hobby. So you mean there are a lot of things that you're supposed to do, even though it might not be your first choice to do? Yes, that are not very funny and I don't know, especially, but uh, they are quite very important for the stakeholders. And the, the, the most important thing is to deliver to the stakeholders, to the client, what they uh, want as the best possible. At the end, they're the stakeholders. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I see. I see what you mean. Yeah, I know. I know what you mean. So sometimes we, um, uh, at least uh, by the uh, young aspiring data scientist, I get, uh, you know, we give them a problem uh, to solve and then they solve it, but like a proof of concept, right? It works. But then there are all the details and all the, the all the, not only communication details, but also to make it work in all kinds of possible conditions. And, yeah. and the details are complicated to master. So it, it's usually the least favorite part of anybody, but we have to do it anyway. 
Yes, of course. But when you say that they, so besides this part, I mean, um, uh, doing the, the, the parts that we don't like, mm -hmm. um, uh, what do you mean when you say to keep cool in stress situations? Uh, is the data scientist job a highly stressful job? Yes, definitely. <laughs> definitely, absolutely. Yes, because uh, the expectation, you know, the stakeholders don't know what you're doing. They don't know what you're doing. They think you, you press a button, And then you get the result. And sometimes if they think it's very complicated and for you it's very easy. So they have not a clue what you're doing. They just know that you're like a magician uh, which can do something out of the data, but they don't really know what you're doing. So uh, sometimes when, you, when they see that you can deliver very fast, they yeah. expect that you can just push the button and uh, yes, then you get in a very stressed situation and then it's very important to to keep cool. I don't say that I'm cool, but uh, it's, uh, it's important to keep cool in such situation, yes. Yeah, okay. So this is, um, yeah, the picture of the data scientist job. Um, so do you have any book that you would like to recommend to, uh, to recommend to the new data scientist, to the the aspiring, eager data scientists who want to learn something new. Okay, but I liked uh, your book, Rosario. You know? It's, My uh, book. <laughs> yes, Codeless Deep Learning is, is very, very easy to understand uh, and very useful. Uh, I don't know if uh, it's quite good enough for an aspiring data scientist because it's, it's, it's more high level. But Uh, otherwise, I, I would start uh, to read mathematic books because you need uh, quite good foundations to understand what you're doing. No? I would start with this and I would start with, with, with a little project. For example, forecasting, I don't know, football games or forecasting uh, something else but, uh, or just making a report about something that you're interested in. And, and then you learn the, 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 the process and the, the tasks that are necessary to, to, to solve a, a problem. I see, I see. Okay, thank you for the appreciation of the Codeless Deep Learning book. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, it, was a, it was fun to write it. Um, okay, um, but you are writing your own book now, right? Yes, but I just started to writing my own book. Um, the title will be Nine Solutions for Real World Applications. And it's a compilation of real world cases solved with Nine together with other tools like uh, Tableau, Jupyter, SQLite. But uh, yes, uh, I'm writing this book. I, very excited but are we going to find in there also the story about the covid 19 spread prediction and the story about the the wefa euro 2020 winner prediction yes of course of course <laughs> what else are we going to find in there can you give us some oof um, yeah Not the, the, too much, too much. no Just but No, uh, it's just in the production. I have uh, some chapters. I've already written some chapters, but um, uh, you will see it. I can just uh, tell you it will, it will be a book with the real wor world cases that you can, uh, yeah, that you can try it out and, uh, and yeah, you will, will have fun. To will do. you have some, uh, some solutions in deep learning, for example? Yes, one, one chapter will be about deep learning, but this will be at the end <laughs> of the book. And yes, I have some, some ideas to, to write this stuff, yes. Okay, we, will, we are all very curious and we are, we are going to wait to see. I hope so, I hope so. What you, what, which kind of solutions you put in, this, in the book? Um, So uh, I have another question. Could be books are definitely an essential tool to get a solid basis, but mm -hmm. what uh, are your usual readings to keep you up to date on new exciting and data stories? So yeah, what do I, you read? 
I like I like everything that uh, that has to do with data science. So I like to read uh, articles on towards data science or low code or medium and so on. Uh, also, sometimes I reread uh, books about uh, mathematics, statistics, just to to stay in shape with this with these topics. Yes. Okay. So before we move to the questions by the audience uh, that we will ask uh, later uh, in a few minutes, we will ask Roberto about uh, what the uh, audience have been asking. Um, so I wanted to ask you something about uh, NIME. So what, what is your preferred feature of NIME or your preferred node? You know, everybody has a bit of the node that they use for everything. So do you have a preferred node? Mine is definitely the group by node, for example. Uh, the uh, really? Node, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Maybe every every node that solves my problem and is a good node. No, but I think I have one. Yes, uh, the table node that you have not yet developed, <laughs> and I think Bernd knows what I mean. I'm still waiting after many years of, for this uh, table. I will pass this uh, reiterated. Yes, I reiterated request to okay. Ben, and then Thank let's you. see if they build the node that you want, the table node, I will yeah. tell them. Okay, um, how can data scientists in the audience get in touch with your work, besides the book that we are all waiting to yeah. see? Yeah, of course. Yes, I've, um, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm posting on LinkedIn and on Twitter, interesting stuff, or sometimes I write uh, articles on Medium. I have also a Facebook group called Data Science with Yodime. Yodime, it's a, it's a cartoon figure that I've created. The name comes from Yoda, Master Yoda from Star Wars, and Nime together gives Yodime. And yes, I have also a YouTube channel called Mark Pictures. Uh, and you will find there some interesting videos about data science. Uh, but not only data sets. So you see, I'm not perfect as well, Rosario. <laughs> not fully 360 degrees data science oriented. No. Okay, um, so let's ask uh, uh, Roberto. Roberto, are there any questions from the audience? So hello, everyone in the audience, and uh, thank you, Dennis, for being part of My Data Guest, the first episode. So we have a few questions um, from the audience concerning your prediction, right, of the Euro 20 um, mm. poker tournament. So one question, for instance, uh, was how did you create, so which inputs did you use for your um, power ratings, uh, so to construct this power rating prediction? So did you use, uh, information about past matches did you use information about football players and mm -hmm. a follow-up question to this would be um did you use a multivariate forecasting model uh, for each country or did you create uh, um or you create a general model so can you please elaborate a little bit on this so this okay how, uh, the, got, uh, the, the audience attention question. okay the first question is about the, the the football ratings and the second for the covid pandemic no, it's still, it's still about the football. Ah, it's still about, okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. oof, uh, it's quite easy, you know, the input variables were the teams. Um, and the output variables were the difference of the scores. I'll make you an example. It's, it's like a matrix, no? It's a matrix you have to figure out. It's like a matrix where you have, in every column, you have a team. And if the team played at home, it's one. If the team played away, it's minus one. And if the team didn't play, it's zero. And at the end, the output variable. The, so it's a one hot encoding of the teams. Yes, it's a one encoding of the teams. And uh, at the other end, there are the difference of the scores. Plus, there is one column with just the one inside. And this is the, the, the home field uh, advantage. Okay. Yeah. So you so basically. The home field advantage it. was one zero, it was just one. No, no, one. And if it was not a home field advantage, would they have a zero? If, yes, because, uh, no, yes. No yes. advantage, okay. Okay, thank you. And um, 
I do have a question, if you don't mind, actually, because I think your so this conversation was very interesting, and I do have a question that has actually regard. So I actually have two. So let's see if we have enough time to ask both. Um, so the first question would be: um, So over time in your long career, um, I suppose you also been engaging in a process of hiring other data scientists, or uh, because of your position. And I was wondering, did you find it hard to find professionals or data scientists that have enough knowledge of NIME? Is it something, yeah. so are we doing enough at NIME as an as a evangelism uh, team to educate uh, people out there in, about NIME? I must be now very careful with this <laughs> <laughs> answer. Uh, oh my God. You know, it's a problem. It's a big problem to find somebody who has this expertise in NIME. And I think because the people who have this expertise in NIME, they have a good job. And, and they don't want to change uh, so very fast. But there are not such a lot of uh, people out there, so candidates out there that are uh, have this expertise in NIME. I don't, mainly in Switzerland, it's not like that. I, I'm missing this this uh, this potential in candidates who have this expertise in nine. It's uh, a lot of a lot of uh, candidates they come with with expertise in in Python or in other with other tools, but not with nine. And I think uh, there is uh, there is a lot of work to do there. Okay, so potentially um, the, uh, let's say, recent graduates um, that the science, maybe in the audience, they could see an option there to kind of open up their possibilities in um, in the industry, right? Uh, by yes. um, by completing their profiles with knowledge about NIME, for instance. That yes. could be something interesting, right? So there okay. is more, more to be done for uh, to fill the bucket of NIME skills in young professionals. Yes. I see. Okay. Great, <laughs> that's a good feedback for us as well in our work. Um, and I have well, actually okay, one. He was, uh, he was very careful, so. <laughs> <laughs> and also have one last question that is actually uh, just out of curiosity. Are you working on another, the network, which is the next mind blowing prediction that you're going to surprise your, your following your audience with? Are you thinking of predicting the next, um, a finalist of the Eurovision of next year or Sanremo Music Festival. What is uh, you are you are trying to? <laughs> no, no, but this would be a good idea. This would be a good idea for the next <laughs> project. Uh, actually, I want to do something with time series. Uh, okay, maybe some prediction about the gold prices. No. It's not something for everybody, but. Uh, <laughs> The topic is quite interesting anyway, because it has to do with time series. And uh, you know, there are quite a, a few approach how to calculate, how to make forecast with time series. So I think the gold price could be an interesting topic for some people, not for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll even see or read the story in your book. Uh, yes. whenever this is going to be released. So, you know, we have a wide audience of people that are really waiting for it. Okay, yeah, that's great. That's all my, from my side. And um, okay. Rosario, maybe you have some other questions? Um, I, I don't have any more questions. Um, so, okay, I think we can then conclude uh, this uh, uh, first episode of the My Data Guest. And I would like to thank Dennis for having shared this experience of the past one year with us and especially the, the fun and less fun detail the projects uh, the details of the fun and less fun projects uh, that he has worked on thank you very much and yeah, i hope to see uh, to see everybody else in uh, uh, in the next uh, episodes of the uh, my data guest the next one will be in october and we'll see who we will, we will invite thank you very much and good evening or good day depending on where you are thank you rosaria bye bye bye